Ruby Volume 6 Episode 1 Argus Limited The Premiere has officially released, so let me break it down for you. So we start off with a fight on a train, but we don't actually start there, that's a flash forward, they get to that event later. So actually we start off in a train station, oh, I wonder where this one's going where we hear Crow giving a detailed report about the events that had transpired at Haven. We learn that the events of current day are only a mere two weeks after the finale. As expected, almost everyone is excited to be heading to Atlas aside from Weiss. I don't think you appreciate the trouble I went through to leave Atlas. <laughs> I live under a very toxic household or my dad is fine with hitting me, but I'll go back. But before they head off, Blake must say her goodbyes to those who are around. First is Ilya, who has not been arrested because she's a good guy now. More or less, her path is as we would have expected it to be even without this interaction. She plans on following Gira's new movement to help the Faunus in whatever way he chooses. Blake explains how they're gonna find the people behind the attack when our favorite monkey boy, Sun, shows up. Neptune is also there. After expressing how he's practically the worst team leader ever for abandoning his team, he determines that his job here is done and Blake doesn't need him to be around any longer. This was such a great moment, from the acting to the music that was playing in the background, this was just such a good Sun moment. And here's the thing about Sun, he's such an underappreciated character, both in universe and out. So many people I don't want to say don't acknowledge, but perhaps may not have realized what he did for Blake. After the fall of Beacon in Volume 3, Blake pushed everyone away aside from her parents. She was done with it, she wanted absolutely nothing to do with anything or anyone. When it came to her friends such as Ruby and Weiss, they didn't accept being pushed away, but they didn't do anything about it. Yang did the worst thing possible by antagonizing Blake and pushing her away as well. Sun was the only character when being pushed away who latched on even harder to her and refused to let her push everyone she knows away. In a moment like that, someone like Sun is what that person needs. When an individual is pushing everyone away, that is when they need those closest to them the most and Sun was the only character who did this. And in return, the fans just call him a stalker and annoying and an obstacle. I think Blake is the only character who will ever fully understand the impact of what Sun did for her. It was a solid send off for his character for the moment until he returns. I do also want to bring up real quick a bit of his dialogue, him saying how he's the worst team leader ever. Honestly that felt not like Sun, but the writers being very meta. All of Volume 4 and 5, the audience kept going off, mainly in a joking manner, about how Sun is a bad leader for abandoning his team. So his dialogue here saying exactly that just felt like the writers being like, hey, we're listening, we hear what you're saying, but they implemented it in a moment that many people weren't actually that upset about. I just wanted to bring that up because I'm not a fan of meta jokes, and that includes this. So finally, we get aboard the train where everything is back to the way it once was. Except for Blake. Blake's not used to the whole change thing as she thinks that Yang needs help taking a bag off of a shelf. I could get thinking that if Yang didn't have a robot arm, you know, the way it should have been. But she's got a damn robot arm, who needs assistance when you have that? You ever look at Ironwood and think, you know, let me just help you get that whiskey off the top shelf, it looks like you need it. So Blake's being weird for no reason. But fortunately for them, this awkward moment is cut short as the train is under attack. Luckily for them, though, Dee and Dudley are there to protect the- Okay, well. Luckily for them, Team Ruby is there to protect the train. They fight and later Ozpin informs them that the relic is what's attracting the Grim, in conjunction with all of the other things attracting the Grim. Everyone's mad and Ruby decides who needs explanations, and Jean uses his semblance to help Ren use his semblance to conceal all of the emotions on the train. It does kind of sort of work until the train gets derailed and everyone dies. Except for this old lady who sounds like a young person pretending to be old. There's not much to say about the fight scene. It was a relatively generic fight. There weren't any moments that stood out or wowed me, but I will say that these types of fight scenes that are kind of just here for eye candy are improving. I didn't take notice of any character floating in the air for too long or anything that looked out of the ordinary. It all appeared to be a pretty grounded sequence, but there are some moments I would like to talk about. First, the relic. To no one's knowledge, including Crow, the relic attracts Grimm. Is this a big deal? I'm sure it is for this volume as it's likely going to bring in some sort of boss Grimm like with volume 4, but for the most part I think our characters are capable of handling them fairly easy up until the boss fight. But once again you ask me, why don't you trust Ozpin? He's only ever trying to do the right thing. But how many times must a man withhold from telling you the truth about something before you distrust him? Crow seemed genuinely upset and shocked of this little hidden detail. The only thing that I did not like about this scene was Ruby stepping in when Ozpin was theoretically about to explain himself. Ozpin has never explained anything. At this point I'm starting to think that part of his curse is the inability to tell someone the truth. 
It's the only reason that would justify why he only ever speaks in riddles and vague terms. Also, him and Oscar, for now, seem alright. He asked for permission to take over, and so he did, but we know something is going to be up with them in the future. The other topic of conversation is Jean's semblance. Holy fuck is it overpowered! Like, it's one thing when you get a boost to your semblance, but Ren covered an entire train of people. How many people was that? Put up the number. That's how many people he uses semblance on. I guess it seems overpowered primarily because we don't know what Ren's limit was. He only ever concealed a maximum of two people, and that was from a short distance. So from that to this is huge. Ruby's gonna go through goddamn time and space if Jean boosts her. At this point, Jean is essentially just a battery for the villains to capture and use to boost themselves. There's a huge target on his back, and considering that Jean is Jean, there's not much he can do about it if he finds himself in a 1v1 against any of Salem's forces. In terms of the lady, there's no new speculation that we can make about her just yet. If you would like to hear some of the theories that I've talked about, then I'd recommend watching my trailer breakdown as I talk about some possibilities with her there. But for now, she's still just an old lady. Now, part of the episode that I skipped, just because 95% of this was Team Ruby, but the other percent was with Adam. He returns to the White Fang headquarters after his failure at Mistral, where the other members mock him? It's incredibly weird because they say things like, you abandon your brothers at Haven. But Adam is literally the leader of the White Fang, and if there's anyone you'd want to escape police custody, it would be your leader. You know, he's much more of a valuable asset outside of prison than he is inside. But instead, it was just like, Psh, pussy, you ran, bitch. Like, what were they expecting to happen? They didn't know Adam kills people, leader of the White Fang. They haven't gotten a sense of his personality just yet. If anything, Adam did the world a favor by rating it of such idiotic individuals. In terms of what's happening with Adam, not much is new. He's still obsessing over Blake and her family, and he's likely going to go on a manhunt. But that's kind of always been the thing that he's been doing. Just now, he's going at it alone. I believe this scene was meant to show us that Adam no longer has any allies from the White Fang. He went back to take command, but they rejected him. Like children, but they still rejected him. So Adam likely is eventually going to hunt Blake and or her family. But I have a feeling that we're not going to be seeing any of Menagerie for a while, so likely Blake. Like I've said in the past, I really hope that he doesn't join forces with Salem because I think that removes how wild of a wild card Adam really is and just makes everything into a black and white scenario. So who knows what Adam is up to for the volume. Blake, on the other hand, does seem to be seeing visions of him for some reason. For saying last volume that she's moved on and he occupies no space in her brain, this seems to hint otherwise. If this continues to happen even without Adam's knowledge, that's a win for him. He's gotten inside of her head and whether or not she likes it, he is on her mind. Same with Yang, but not same with Yang because you only ever had like one nightmare. The animation. I've said this before, I need to stop talking about it. Of course it looks amazing and it's even better than last year's. There has never been a case where I thought, man, things are really going backwards. Volumes 1 through 3 kept getting better each volume, volumes 4 through 6 keep looking better. The only time the animation has drastically changed was with the Maya and Poser switch. But yes, this volume looks absolutely beautiful from this episode and hopefully all of the other ones have the budget in them as well. In conclusion, this was a great first episode, super entertaining, there was a lot of fighting and nothing seemed off about it. There weren't many moments to critique and for a 22 minute episode, it's very impressive. This is starting off strong, but many people felt the same way with Volume 5 and ended up not liking it. For me, I'm just hoping that any current gripes that I have with certain characters either get fixed, go away, or just never get brought up again. So that was episode 1 of volume 6, Argus Limited. Be sure to let me know what you guys thought of the episode down in the comments below. Be sure to like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you're interested in more content like this, follow me on all social medias, and I'll see you in the next video.